Thank you for joining me all today to talk about <coughs> prioritization. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been doing product for about 10 years now. I started my career as a software engineer, but moved over to product. I've done product roles in both consumer and enterprise companies. Um, why care about prioritization? So I think prioritization is at the heart of what product managers do. It's in some ways the most important thing we do, right? Because if you don't build the right thing, your product's not going to be successful. And so prioritizing well you know, is crucial to making your product a success in the market. And the other thing I say about prioritization is that it gets asked a lot about in job interviews. Um, and I don't really specifically address that topic here, but I think it's, import it's just important from that point of view, too, since it's a very common question. And as we're going along, please feel free to ask me questions. I, I want to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so agenda today is, uh, first of all, just define what we're talking about, walk through some different prioritization frameworks, step back a little bit to look at like how, how are we actually creating value in our products. Because that's kind of at the heart is we're trying to prioritize the things that will bring us the most return. And then talk about some tips, practical tips, for like how to do prioritization. So for definition, um, so I went to Webster's and it says prioritize to list or rate project goals, et cetera, in order of priority. Well, OK, that doesn't actually tell us that much until we define priority. So priority, preferential rating, especially one that allocates rights to goods and services, usually in limited supply. Well, for product managers, the thing that we're most often allocating is our engineering resources. And those are always a limited supply. No matter how many engineers you have, there'll be more things that people want you to do than you have resources for. Um, and the other thing that I think that is important here when we think about prioritization is that the choices that you're making are your strategy in the long run. If you say, Our, my strategy is to do X over here, but you keep prioritizing Y, effectively your strategy is Y. And so this is really, Prioritization is the implementation of your product strategy. And if you go implement something else, that's what you get. The other thing I want to point out, right, when you look at the Webster's Dictionary definition and kind of how people think about it, they always think about, OK, is A more important or is B more important? But for most of our efforts in trying to prioritize things, the scope is not fixed. Right? It's not that I have to do all of what people propose for A, all of what people propose for B. right? core job of the product manager is to figure out how far to go in each of those areas. Because like, part of A may be really important, and that's like second half doesn't really bring that much value. So maybe we shouldn't do that. And so when we prioritize, we've got to keep both of those in mind. So moving on to frameworks. So I think the, the one that everyone uses is revenue. So we look at here, we've got four potential things we can do with different revenue values associated with them. Which one, which one looks the best? C. D looks the best. Is C the best? No. Okay, you guys, yeah, so you guys are ahead of the game here, right? Yeah, it looks the best. You just look at revenue, but then how much effort is it going to take? Right? So, I mean, really, we should at least compute the effort. And I, I just used abstract units here. This could be story points, whatever you want them to be. And so, so now which one's the best? Yeah, so D's, uh, yeah, B's got the high, what did I say here? Yeah, B's got the highest ratio, right? B's got the highest ratio of revenue, revenue to effort. And if we had 50 story points available, instead of picking C, we could have picked A and D, and we got $110,000 in revenue. But, you know, the next question is, is, is this is an improvement over just revenue, but is even this a good metric? Anyone? I, I think there's a lot of limitations when it comes to revenue. Um, and I'll start with the one at the top, which is kind of obvious, but even that people don't think about, is that the desired, your desired outcome is high profitability. So if you're prioritizing things that bring a lot of unprofitable revenue, I think that, that's, that's clearly a problem. But even if we can assume that like, our revenue is kind of equally profitable, the margin on what we'd be doing is about the same. Um, the error in the estimates for revenue is ginormous. I mean, engineers love to come and ask me, like, how much revenue is this going to bring, especially if they don't want to do something. 
And you know, the truth is, we never know. Like, how well can your company predict revenue on existing products? Like, even if you don't make any change, like next quarter, how much are you gonna make? If you're in a SaaS business, you'll be like, well, I know the turn right. Well, okay, but then the question is, how much new revenue are you gonna get? That's really hard to predict. Like, how many customers are you gonna sign up? Uh, what's their lifetime value of those customers? And if you're more of a licensed model, you really don't know how much you're gonna get. People have a hard time predicting this on something you know and you have operating history on. So when we start talking about doing something new, like, there's a whole bunch of uncertainties around that. Like, you know, how much do customers actually buy on that? Um, you know, what's the competition, is the, where's the competitive situation gonna be when we actually finish it? The, 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 you, don't really, you don't really know how much revenue you're gonna get. Um, and, you know, I kind of took this idea, Rich Moranoff has a really nice blog post series called Four Laws of Software Economics, and he, ta he, he talks about this. And sometimes, you know, people ask us to do specific things to win specific deals or satisfy a particular customer. And that revenue estimate may be a little bit more reliable, because at least there's a number associated with it. But I don't know about you guys, but I always find the sales rep, one, overestimates how likely that deal is to close. And two, you know, the amount of the deal, it, it really turns out to be more than they said, and often turns out to be less. But I think there's actually a bigger, more pernicious problem going on here, is that once you start, like, if you're focused on revenue, that biases you towards things that are short-term and well-known, right? Because those are the things that are, you have the best accuracy on estimating revenue on. Like, the newer and something innovative something is, like, the, the, the more your numbers just become like some sort of fiction you pulled out of the air. And so my contention is you can't get to a differentiated product offering if, if your goal, if you're just sitting here prioritizing based on revenue. So one model that people use to try to deal with this is weighted scoring, right? So we, this, this chart here takes a bunch of different factors, like, okay, how much revenue how much customer value? I think we'll, we'll talk later about how like, like those are really like part of the same coin. Strategic value, implementation effort, operational costs. And so I think this is an improvement because at least it brings in multiple factors. But it's not, um, I, I think there's still a bunch of problems here, right? And the good part is that it actually is like kind of a checklist for you to make sure you think about all those things, which you should. But problems you get into here it's like one, the scores are arbitrary. Like, I have workplaces that use systems like this, and then sometimes people want to know, especially if you're kind of got like a product portfolio, people with different interests, they're like, how do we have to write this to get a high enough score, right? They kind of game the system and work backwards. Oh yeah, the customer value on this is an eight, because I need an eight to get you to pay attention. Um, it doesn't drive any strategic coherence, right? It's essentially trying to create an equation that you can like drop some numbers in and come out with a result, right? So you get, essentially, at the end of it, if you just do this blind, you get a bunch of like random, unconnected features. And that, to me, is its biggest problem. It assumes that the value of a feature is independent. If I have a list of 10 features, I know the value of all of them, but often, if you want to be really good, you want a differentiated product, you need like a group of features that really serve one segment well. So that group together may generate a lot of value where by itself, it doesn't, it, the, the value may be much lower. I think it also kind of biases you towards chasing competitors. Because again, we're in this problem that, like these numbers drive us to things that are pretty well known, that we can understand, that we, that we can estimate. Another model sometimes people use is like they let their stakeholders vote these can be internal or external stakeholders. Sometimes they try to mix effort into this, so they'll give them a certain budget and say, here are the projects, here's how many story points you are, how you have, and you can essentially, like, how would you allocate it? So essentially they're sort of buying a feature with this budget you've given them. I think the good part of this is it gathers input from stakeholders. And your stakeholders feel heard when you do this. Well, what's the problem with this? Like, once you say it's voting, they actually expect you to follow it. Right? They're going to be very irritated if you don't. Um, and there's not, it's not, they're not, stakeholders aren't thinking like from a strategic point of view here. Like, where do we want this product to be? They're like, I have a bunch of problems I need. 
So if you go to your customer support team and say, yeah, here's your budget, right? Like Voda said, they're gonna solve their immediate problems. Um, your sales team's gonna do the same thing, right? Like, and those guys tend to over-index, like what, what over-index on the last deal they lost, right? They, they have almost like no memory. Like they can't even remember the deal they lost last quarter. It's like the deal I just lost two weeks ago because you guys didn't have this feature that nobody else wants. Um, and this will definitely bias you towards chasing competitors because a lot of your stakeholders are gonna be like, oh, you guys are missing this, I can't sell this, it's causing me a retention problem, you know, like, like that kind of stuff. So kind of step back here a little bit, I wanna talk about this Kano model. The Kano model is a model that was developed for looking at functionality consumer products. It was developed in the 80s by a professor in Japan named Kano. And it breaks different functionality into three categories. There's that basic functionality in the bottom, and these are the things your product must do to even be credible and considered in a category. So a smartphone has to make phone calls, or people just wouldn't think of it as a phone. It'd be some sort of like mini tablet, right? You're just not, not credible. Then in the middle, you've got performance features. And so if you look at the axis, it's the axes here. It's like, how, how fully have you implemented this? And how much does that make people happy? Now, the Kano model uses the term delight, which I'm not, which I'm not super happy about. Like, I just prefer customer satisfaction because I think delight buys us in certain ways. But so those features in the middle are what are called performance features, and these are generally things that are more is better. So, like on a smartphone, it'd be battery life. Like, two days is better than one day. A day is better than eight hours, right? And people generally want more. And these are things your customers understand and know about. It's in a product category that they understand. And these are the kind of things people ask you for. And then the top, that top line there, the excitement features, these are the ones that are unexpected to the consumer. And they're the ones that can generate the highest like, satisfaction or delight because they do something that like often the consumer didn't think was possible. And so this is often a latent need in your consumer base. They don't come and ask you for this because they don't even know they want it. And part of the reason it does so well on customer satisfaction is because like the consumer doesn't know they want it, your competitors probably don't know they want it either, right? Unless you know your customer base very well, you won't find these. And so an example like, of an of a excitement feature is like when the original iPhone came out, it had a web browser that was actually useful you could look at real websites with it. Like I remember smartphones before the iPhone, right? I had a Blackberry, I had this memory like 2007, I'm trying to like look up a movie time and it was terrible. It took me like five minutes, I could never find it. And so when people saw like, I can actually use a real website on my phone, like, like that, that blew people away. Um, because they didn't expect it and it was something that satisfied a big need for them. But this, that example actually shows something else about this model that's really important when we think about features and how much value they bring. So in 2007, that was like an amazing feature. What is it today? <laughs> it's a threshold feature. You have a web, you have a, you're trying to sell a smartphone that has a web browser that doesn't like do a good job looking at any website. Like you're not a smartphone anymore. You're now a dumb phone, right? So this is what happens over time. Your excitement features are tomorrow's basic threshold features. Maybe you'll cover it later on, but are these sort of building blocks? So essentially, if you have, you have to choose between excitement feature versus basic one, how do you go about doing that? Well, so like the, ba the, the thing about the basic one is that you probably have to have it or you're not credible at all. So like the, you know, sometimes the question of how far you'll go on that basic one, but you're probably more often trading off against performance features and excitement features. And we will talk kind of a little bit about how to think about well to value these. So a lot of text here, but um, so I think all stuff we already covered. Um, and so one of the things that's interesting about the Kano model is it's from the 80s, but a lot of it's, it's kind of the foundation of all how people think about this stuff today. Because we hear a lot about delighting, con delighting customers. Well, you know, this is what Kano was talking about like in 1984. <coughs> and so we, so, like, this is a popular model I've seen. It's created by a guy named Adam Nash. I actually know Adam. I went to high school with him. 
And he would have been the same year in school I was, so Adam is like a genius, and he'd skip two grades. So he was two grades ahead of me. Uh, and so Adam gives us three categories. He gives us these metrics movers. Um, and these are specific to your business. Um, and I actually think he developed this when he was at LinkedIn. So you know, and they had metrics around engagement, how many people they were signing up. And so these are really kind of more about your business. Um, they might tell you a little bit about how happy your consumers are, depending on what you pick. But your consumers don't really, customers don't really care how much revenue you're getting. Um, and then you got the customer request. And if we map those back to the Kano model, those are the performance features. And then customer delight, right? Those are the excitement features. Um, and then I, I took this and said, well, it didn't really fit for me for enterprise. So I, I, I changed it around a bit. I, I put one up. The top one up there, which is some combination of strategic goals, what you want your product to be, your differentiators. And so these are excitement features in the Kano model. And then the bottom two are more the performance features and possibly, depending on where you are, like your sort of basic threshold features. But what's preventing you from selling more? Like what do your salespeople complain about? Like it's making it hard for them to win. And what are your customers requesting? Where are their pain points in the product? Right? This is like, if you don't address these, you get low satisfaction, you get churn. And I thought I'd talk for a minute about why I think these are different, right, between consumer and enterprise. I think it comes down to what people's like motivations are to use, to use or buy a product. So for enterprise products, primarily people care about, I need to get more revenue or I need to save cost. And the individuals who kind of make the decisions they're either, they want to look good by driving one of these things, or it's more sort of like, like their personal motivation may be, like this saves me two hours a day, I can go home to my family sooner. But in the consumer world, there's a lot of extra motivations that don't exist in the enterprise, like entertainment. Like you can't go sell people an enterprise product because this is going to entertain your employees. It's like, we don't care, that's what they do on their own time. So social connection status. And I think that's why we tend to talk about delight more in the consumer world. Because just people being like happy using the product is enough to get them to use it or buy it. OK, so then, so we, this tells, tells us a lot, of, a lot of different frameworks here. But they, 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 when, I, when I thought about them, I was like, well, there's still this missing piece about like how much value do you assign to these different things, right? Kind of model kind of helps us give a model to think about it, but I think it's helpful to step back and think about like how do we actually create value in our products? And so our products have to be different and better than the competitors for at least some segment of the consumers for them to have above average value, right? If we're exactly the same as the competitor, our value to the user, to the consumer who's ever buying it, who our customer is, is gonna be the same. And there's an important point here that you want to create more value because we th think about revenue, but if we think about revenue as the share of value we capture, you cannot capture more than you create. And so our upward bound really is how much value we're creating for the customer. And so this afternoon, if you guys aren't sick of hearing me talk, I'll go into this more depth. I'm gonna, I have another presentation on business strategy. But I think for here, just suffice to say, we want to increase more value. Like if we increase value, that gives us the opportunity to capture more. And a couple of features, like, like when we're going prioritizing, like in that weighted scorecard, is not going to give us a differentiated offering from our competitors. Right? It's too easy to copy. Like so here's ad hoc selecting things because I'm like, oh, this is going to bring me value in a quarter or two. That doesn't, in the long run, get you something that drives superior, superior value over your competitors. Right, so you need concentrated effort over a long period of time and deep understanding of your customer needs to build something that is better than your competitors that they can't just copy. And so what this means for prioritization is that you need a solid product strategy. Like, that's probably one of the most important things I'm gonna tell you today is that, that, that the core of this, is if you don't have a solid product strategy, like you don't know where you're going and so you can't really prioritize anything but short term needs and chase your competitors, right? And I find a lot of situations where people are struggling to prioritize, they're like, what should we do? It's because you don't have, like, like the thing that's missing is not your skill of prioritizing, is that you don't know where you're going. 
And so this can be, sometimes this is on the product team, but often this is coming to like executive management hasn't set you a solid direction. Um, there's two things I want to touch on here um, that, that go to this idea of how much value you're creating. And one is this jobs to be done theory. So the idea here is what, what is a customer hiring your product to do? And this is often not what you think you're selling, right? And so the first approximation of this, and the one marketers like, is that people don't buy drills. They buy holes in their wall, right? They, they buy the, uh, they're hiring you to solve some problem for them. I need a hole in my wall so I can ha hang this picture. And this is good, but I think it's, it's also limited, right? So there are contextual factors that are really important. Like in this drill example, like it's doing other jobs, right? The guy who buys the drill, it may also provide him credibility that he actually knows something about home repair. So if the drill doesn't, um, it, it, the, the, say you made the drill pink, right? People, it's not gonna serve that job for a guy, right? Who's, he's not gonna go to the hardware store and buy it. And this also kind of helps us, if we think about all the jobs the drill is doing, um, like it's also supposed to do it with the least hassle possible, right? Like it's supposed to just like save me time and make it easier. Or else I could just use some like, I don't need to use a power tool, I can just use some hand tool. And this is why drills, like, like the market got take, went from corded drills to cordless, right? Because one of its core jobs was to, was to save people time. So why is this important for prioritization? Because thinking about the job hones in on the customer value. Um, a good resource for this is um, Clayton Christensen, who's a professor at Harvard, and he wrote a book about this. It's called Competing Against Luck, but he goes into this in great depth. There's also an HBR article. The other thing that I won't go into great depth on, but I think it's really important when we think about prioritization, is your customer segmentation. Right? We could spend a whole hour on this, or our keynote speaker this morning talked about they spent two months on it in his MBA. But the thing about that you, your customers are going to be in different groups that have like light needs. And if you haven't done a good job segmenting your customers, this becomes hard to figure out like where you're going to create a lot of value in your product. Because if I have like three or four main segments of my customer base and I do like one, one or two things that makes the niche happy, right, you're not, like it's not going to be a, none of these segments are going to see this as a great product, right? They might see it as good. So to get high satisfaction in a segment, to really drive a lot of customer value, often you need a group of related features focused on that segment. And so not thinking about like what segment you're, you're serving when you prioritize means you've kind of got this, you end up with like this bloated product that doesn't like serve anyone really well. Like, like you know, one of my examples of this might be Microsoft Word. Right? It's got a zillion features in it. Most people don't use it. Like, who is it really ideal for? I don't know, you know. Like, it, there's, there's just, like, it doesn't, it's not focused on any, not, it's not great at anything. Okay, so now that we've thought about value, think about pra um, some practical ways to prioritize. So one of the things I like to do is think about your effort ratio. Right, pick your buckets, and earlier we talked about different setups for different ways you can bucket, but I mean often it comes down to some version of st like strategic things, features you want to do. The one that everyone leaves out, which is like sort of maintenance and tech debt, like you really, sh I, I tend to think in software products, it's really important to spend some time there or else like your velocity keeps falling over time as like, you don't kind of go back and make sure you have a solid platform. And then um, often when I've done this, people want to allocate like some percentage of resources to like moonshots, innovation, and often this like comes up like this 10% number is really popular if you go talk to your stakeholders. Um, I'm actually not a fan of this. Like, like I have, I spent two and a half years working on a corporate innovation team and I find that like, like this sort of like approach where you like wall something off I haven't seen it create a lot of value. So I'll, I'll tell you there, you're probably just better off having your engineers do a two-day hackathon and see what they come up with. Um, but the idea here is that you, at the, 
beginning of your quarter or whatever time frame you want to do this on, you know, figure out what you think this should be. Like, you know, maybe you want to spend, you know, 40% of your time on strategic initiatives, 40% on kind of run-of-the-mill features, um, and spend 20% on maintenance, or you know, maybe you do 10% maintenance and 10% innovation. But whatever you think it should be, get buy-in from your stakeholders and measure it at the end of the end of the cycle, or the quarter, or whatever it is. Um, and this will tell you if you're actually doing what you think you're doing. A lot of times I find you're not, right? Because you know things come up. It's also you know like in software context, often like probably want to look at. It isn't in the people generally don't plan for it. But there's always a bunch of escalations your engineers end up spending time on. So like I'm just understanding where the time goes is important to say. Am are the things that I think I'm prioritizing where are the efforts actually going? And this will shift over time. That's why I say do it on a quarterly basis. At some point, like doing a bunch of big strategic things might be really important. That might be the direction your executive management has set out for you. And that, that's fine. You just want the idea here is to say, did we actually are we spending our time where we think we're spending it? So the next one is to break things into, into groups. And the reason for this comes is more of a cognitive reason, right? We tend to all operate in an agile world today, so we have this whole bunch of stories. And so you have 50 or 100 stories, right? It's just not possible to accurately rank them against each other because your brain is not capable of 50 or, like, like really thinking about 50 or 100 things at, to at a time. It, like, I went and looked up the research on this, and there's a debate whether the magic number is, like, you can keep four things in your head once or seven. Um, but it's not 50. And it's certainly not 100. And so, like, both for your own purposes, you'll struggle. Like, like, like if you say, I got 50 things, I'm going to make a rank order list of importance. You can't decide whether something should be 20 or 22. And your stakeholders don't care either, right? They, like, they, they want the big picture. And so grouping like items together makes, makes it easier to you, for you to do a better job as a product manager and makes your priorities understandable to your stakeholders. So another thing I like to do is keep a priority, rank order priority list. And this, again, not at the story level, and this is a short one. This is what our engineering team is going to like work on next, like over the next like one, two, maybe three three months. And I like this for a number of reasons. It's helpful for planning your sprints, right? Because then you know, like, okay, we want, we want to take the stories from these things. Um, it's really good for transparency, because if you're publishing this list, I think you should publish it and update it. Like, all your stakeholders, your management knows, like, what you're actually going to spend resources on. And it's also really helpful for um, explaining why you're not doing something. Right, so like how many of you have had people come up, you know, get, oh, just add this one thing to this, you know, this month's development plan, or get it in this sprint, or we need to do it in the next, in the next, you know, whatever, four weeks, right? People show up all the time with that request, whether it be executive wants some new feature, or whether, you know, sales guy is like, we can close this deal only if you do this giant feature for me. They never say it's giant, right, but, you know, Often it's a you know often it's significant effort, and so the, the nice thing about having like a short rank order list is it makes it really clear what you're going to trade off against, right? If I go stick something at the top of that list, well, all those other things have to move down, and so this works this and this works for we're keeping it that small number, the one that we can actually think about rather than rather than a hundred items. Would, yeah. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking, would like a group be one of these items? A group? Yeah, because you had said. Um, yeah, it's like these. Create thematic. Groups. These thematic buckets, right? So, so like one of these groups, okay. right? So like, like an example that I'm working on right now is that um, I work in ad tech, and this Europeans have this new regulation coming out about how you can use data. It's called General Data Protection rules, GDPR, and so like that's a group for me, right? There's a bunch of associated things um, kind of across the product portfolio, and but it, like, like 
I think, you know, I kind of think about them as one thing. That's how stakeholders think about them. Like, are we ready for this? When are we going to have that available? So that's, it's a good group. I mean, you don't want your groups to be things that are going to take, like, some giant thing that's going to take you a year. Like, but, you know, something that's a, you know, a light set of development efforts. And this, then this uh, step would be the ordering. Yeah, basically ordering the, the ones in the near term that you're going to do over the next couple of months. And so for so in my current role, we do steering committee meetings every two weeks. And so this is always kind of like one of the first things I talk about. I'm like, okay, here's where I told you the priorities were last time. Like maybe we finished a couple. Here are the changes I'm making. And I find this is really helpful because people then know what's going on. There's no there's no surprises. And I'm not like tiny things don't make it onto this list. Like. You know, or like there's an escalation, we have to fix some customer bug. These are kind of, you know, a little bit meatier, higher level things. Like maybe, you know, they probably correspond to an epic and agile terminology. So once you let's say set up these groups, I really like this. I mean, I do that <coughs> in my employment as well. But then this escalation sits coming up. Do you? Do you have a separate bucket for it, or you try to do it in a group, and then within the group, we decide whether it's really... So currently, I'm, I just handle escalations independently of this. Mm -hmm. Right, and for me, I think the important thing is to try to track how much of the development effort is going into those escalations. Um, so I, don't, I, don't, I mean, what do you found works for you? Yeah. For me, it's, it, it always, I always go down to the current says, out of these five, I have like one particular group. But the 80% of the time, those questions will either fit in one of these groups. And then, then within that group, I have to have phase one, phase two. So, okay, and the priority for this group is within the group, we have to have some sort of a inner priority as well. Yeah. And then we say, okay, we're addressing you know, first phase of this group in here, and then we'll do the next phase. I, mean, I don't I think mean, that's the best route, but. Yeah, if I'm phasing them, I will usually break these into separate buckets mm -hmm. because. Because if I, I've, I've got this group that's got these things in it, I'm going to do phase one like next sprint, and the other ones I might do four sprints later. I, and I, I find, it, at least for me, it's not communicating out what what I want the stakeholders to like understand about where time and effort's going. Yeah, typically, I don't say like we have we're going to work on it right now. Yeah. That just breaks the cadence of the engineer. <laughs> everything goes by word. No, no, definitely true. I mean, so so I think about it as like this queue, right? So at the top of the queue are the things that are actually in progress. And then unless there's some crazy emergency, they're, they're like you slot things in, like, okay, we've decided to change priorities for whatever reason. It's gonna go in like when we finish the stuff that's in progress. Mm -hmm. Which for me would often be like actually sort of like number three in the list. Because there might be one or you know, two things in progress. So the other thing to think about when it comes to prioritization is like how much focus to drive, right? We had the keynote speaker this morning talk about driving, like focus is really important. Um, and I, I agree with him, right? And I think the challenge here, and it, it comes down to how you prioritize stuff, is that most organizations default to betting widely. They are, um, like new, new ideas come along, people want to do them, executives like them, in some ways they have this siren song, like, like this could be a great success, right? Especially like when it's like a new idea and they're like, oh yeah, we should definitely, we should definitely do this, right? But like this is the point where the, like the obstacles are unknown. Like often you don't estimate the competition properly, like or think about like, okay, wh what are the customers' alternatives, right? Because you haven't dug into it. Like I like to call this the organizational version of Dunning Kruger effect. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. The Dunning-Kruger says to actually know that you are not good at something takes a certain level of confidence in that area. So when you know nothing, you actually think that you are better than you are. And the other thing that's interesting about Dunning-Kruger is that sometimes people go, you know, just explain why people are clueless, but we're all subject to the Dunning-Kruger effect in some area. Like, I've actually tried to like program my brain, so the second I think something I don't know a lot about, how hard can that be, I'm like, yeah, I'm going down that. Um, but I think to, you know, to achieve anything really meaningful is you, you have to drive some focus. And I, I really like this quote from Steve Jobs, so I'll just read it verbatim. People think focus means saying yes to the thing that you've got to focus on. 
But that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundreds of other good ideas that there are. You have, you have to pick carefully. I'm as proud of the things that we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. And so when this comes to prioritization, right, if we're going to try to drive superior value, um, we, got, we have to say no to a lot of stuff. And so the question is, like, practically, how do you do that? And I will actually say here, I think half the problem is product management in most organizations. I think there are a lot of other problems, but product managers, we're kind of all a bunch of overachievers. Nobody likes to take a task and say at the end of this, I'm going to produce functionality that gets a C. Like, if you grade it versus the competition or how much people like it. But I think you have to focus on things. You have to be willing to get C's, sometimes not do anything at all. Like, we're saying no to this. But like, if we go back to the Kano model, it's one of those threshold features, or it's a performance feature where we have to get to like a certain, certain level to like not have it be an impediment to customer satisfaction or being able to sell the product. Um, but oftentimes, you should stop there. Like, if it's not one of those places you're planning to differentiate and say, this is really where we're driving value, sometimes you want things to just be good enough. Um, and so, and then you can take that engineering effort you would have used to take something that was non-critical and take it from a CDNA and put it someplace where it actually does you some good. Like, from a product management leadership point of view, I think it's important that leaders stress efficiency and go, do we really need this part of it? Yeah, because you often get in a situation where, yeah, something is an impediment or it's driving low satisfaction, but you could just fix it just enough. And if leadership is you know, coming back and saying, like, prove to me that this extra resource is actually valuable here as opposed to somewhere else, I think that really helps. Now, the other half of the problem for this is your stakeholders. Because they're always pushing you to add one more thing, right? So the question is, like, how do you stop that from happening and try to, so you can maintain focus when you're prioritizing and, you know, take those areas that are really part of your strategy where you want to differentiate and excel and do well. So and I, I think one of the important things here, and that Steve Jobs quote is kind, of starts, kind of starts this idea, is oftentimes when we're debating internally whether we should do something, people frame the debate about whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. Actually, I find the bad ideas just go away. Like, like people realize they're bad ideas. Like most of the things you actually seriously consider, they're good ideas, right? And so I stipulate that up front. It's not that this is not a good idea. It doesn't create, we know it creates some value. The question is, does it create more value than all the other things we could do? Like we've got all these other things on the roadmap or that priority list I was talking about. And so is this better to do than those? And I think this helps too, because the person who proposed the idea, at least you're validated. You're saying it's good. It's just a question of, you know, is it the right thing for us to do or the right thing for us to do in the short term? The other thing I'll point out here, and this doesn't just apply to prioritization, is that there's a lot of evidence that says deciding yes or no on an option leads to poor decision making. That you get much better outcomes when you look at multiple options. And this is kind of what you're driving towards here. We have this engineering resource bucket and we can choose between these things. It's not whether we should do option A or not. It's like of all of these options, like A through F, like which ones we want to do over the next time period. There's actually really good research on this too, like, um, like corporate acquisitions. This is one of the reasons there's so many bad acquisitions is because decision making is always like acquire or not acquire. And then if it's not, like there's no alternative presented. So it's like do nothing. And so that tends to push people towards doing things that are maybe unwise. Have you heard of the McDonald's uh, option or the uh, McDonald's approach? It's, no. Um, the idea if you have a bunch of people at work or wherever want to go out to lunch and nobody can decide, someone just suggests, let's go to McDonald's. And instantly people will come up with like some criteria for like better ideas. Uh, and let's figure this out and where do we really want to go. OK, I, I, have, I haven't heard it called that. I, I, I've seen that trick before where sometimes like, like people are looking at this problem and like we don't know what to do about it and like everyone's like, oh, what should we do, what should we do? And you just propose some really bad idea and it gets people to propose better ones. They're like, no, no, I, I got something better than that. Yeah. 
The, um, ideas aren't the problem. I, I like what you said earlier about when you said um, the, the priorities list yeah. and um, publishing that or sharing that. Um, I, I've coached our executives not to ask for, like, can we have this one more feature? Now they know, hey, you have priorities, but um, they need to share it with other people. You know, they need to share it with, uh, the product owner needs to share it with the executive, needs to share it around. Yeah. Um, and then just knowing that you have priorities helps push back. No, yeah, definitely. It, it definitely helps. I mean, the other thing is, is like how, the other thing I'll suggest here is how can you, like, further validate these ideas? Like, so we're not trying to make decisions in vacuums. Like, can you actually do what I call real MVP? Um, like, like, MVP is, like, sort of, often people take it as some stripped down version of the product that's gonna take you six sprints to build and actually isn't useful. But is there something you can do that, like, really has no development work or very little that allows you to get, test something out there? Like, see, the, the lean startup theory around the MVP was something to get knowledge. It wasn't like a quarter of a product that you intend to like then go build the other three quarters of. Often it's something that you would do and throw away. Like just to help you validate the idea. So that, that way you can spend less effort on it. And so at the end of this, what this comes down is like, you know, my argument is that you should really focus your prioritization on how much customer value you're creating. Like we tend in businesses to focus on revenue because it's close to the end goal of profit, but this is an outcome. Like I was talking about earlier, revenue is the share of customer value we capture. And so if we can create more value, then we can capture more. And my argument is that customer value is easier to measure. Because you can, like the questions around customer value, does it solve a real customer problem? Does the, how much does the customer care about this problem? You can go find this out by talking to customers. Um, and seeing like, like how big a problem it is for them. I mean, one of the mistakes people sometimes make with this is that if you, ask, if you go ask a customer, do you, want, do you want X, the solution you already have in your mind, they kind of assume they're getting it for free and they say, yeah, sounds interesting, right? But if you go talk to them about what problem you're trying to solve for them, yeah, I think you have a much better discussion because they, you know, you often, they'll, sometimes they'll tell you, yeah, this is like a horrible problem for us and we'd really like you to, we really like someone to solve it or we're desperate for a solution. A lot of times they're like, oh, it's really not that bad. And so, and then you ask yourself the question, how many customers have this problem? I think these are all much more easy questions to answer than when you get like focused on this revenue problem. And it's not that revenue is not important. And if you're doing some big initiative, you know, it's important to look for reasons why you might not be able to capture value. But if you start from the value frame, like I think you'll make better decisions. And then can I take this sort of value capture as sort of a secondary consideration? Because the problem most, whether they be features or new products have, is not, is not, that, they, they, not that they create a lot of value that can't be captured. It's that they don't create enough value at all because our assumptions when we went into them weren't correct about how much, the, how much, a, how much this actually matters to the customer. So, so this, is, this is my summary, right, is that you need a solid product strategy to be able to prioritize well. What we're trying to prioritize our way to is differentiated products that create superior value in the market. And that to do that, you're going to have to drive focus, say no to good ideas, and say no to a bunch of good ideas, and then prioritize primarily on customer value. Right? Because these revenue estimates that most people use are unreliable. I think they, they put us thinking in the wrong place. So um, they asked us to uh, remind you guys to vote on <coughs> which sessions you like. And now we're open for questions. Um, how do you, so assessing the customer values regards a lot of thought into the question. I like the slide where you talked about three questions. I think the middle question is probably more important than that. Like how, do they, how much do they need? How much do they care about the problem? Yeah. Because they'll always have problems, and every customer has, but no one, no customer has ever said, that, hey, do you have this problem? They never said no. Well, well no. I mean, sometimes I, 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 I've talked to people, and you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, it's a little bit of an issue, but yeah. not that much. Or sometimes they'll even be like, 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 once you get them in the frame of thinking about, I want to talk to you about your problem, sometimes they'll be like, yeah, well, yeah, that's kind of not that big a deal. Yeah, this thing over here, that's where that's where it's keeping me up at night, right? So then you have to prompt them. So how do you 
measure that in terms of, let's say, quantitative analysis. The first time, the way I start doing it is revenue and everything is easy number to get. So at least get some. To get a number. What number, number, get a number. It's not really good or bad. But the customer value is more qualitative research that you need to do the grant work and everything else. Is there any sort of framework to put some weighting or numbers? Or any, I don't know if there is that, but it, it just looks like a lot of quality of research that you have to do or have an idea about your own customers. Yeah, no, I agree with you it's qualitative, right? That, um, you know, and perhaps you may have to use that research to back into a revenue number to sell up the chain. Mm -hmm. But I think even if you're just, if you're making your initial decision, like this is worth going after, because I see it creates a lot of customer value, I think that is, I think you'll make better decisions, mm -hmm. right? Even if you have to like make up some revenue number. And then, like, it's like, like I was saying about that weighted scorecard thing, like part of the, re people game all these numbers, yeah. right? Like, so in some ways it's harder to game the story of I went and talked to this customer and they told me this great story. Like, like if you relay the story about why this issue that they can't solve the day is causing them so much pain. That's actually like much harder to game. Because you know, it's attributed to a real person and it came like straight, straight from a customer. Other questions? Great, well thank you then.